So they say good things come to those who wait. So for those of you who waited longer, thank you very much. Um, just some quick reminders. The panel is about to begin. So please switch off your mobile devices or turn them to silent mode. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Stella from the Conservation Department of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, and I will be your MC for today's panel discussion. On behalf of the URA and the CLC, or Centre for Livable Cities, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And if it's your first time to the chamber, you are sitting in a historic seat. So um, later on, when it's photo taking time and you have the time to please come down and explore the historic seats that you're sitting in. And it's definitely historic in more ways than one. Not only was this site the site of Temengong settlement, but it was also the house built by John Maxwell and likely to be the oldest standing structure from the first days of modern Singapore. As the former Parliament House, it has witnessed many legislative debates since 1959, with many issues, including that of conservation and preservation, raised and passed in this very chamber that we're all sitting in today. Since March 2004, this place has been transformed and repurposed as part of the Civic District Master Plan to serve as part of our arts and cultural infrastructure. In 2004, the restoration and conversion by CPG consultants garnered the URA Architectural Heritage Awards for good restoration. Just as important, this building is now accessible and well used by the new generation of Singaporeans, making meaning for the future. As we're surrounded by heritage, I would also like to mention that the Singapore Heritage Festival is ongoing and in fact into its final weekend. We hope you have had the chance to take part in many of the events of the Singapore Heritage Festival. Today, as we discuss what's next for conservation, we will also be launching CLC's latest urban system study, Past, Present and Future, Conserving the Nation's Built Heritage. It is timely that the publication is being launched as we mark 30 years this year since the first historic districts were conserved. As we think about the next big milestones for conservation in Singapore, it's also important to reflect on the lessons from the past. Before we get to our exciting panel discussion this afternoon, I would first like to invite Ms. Elaine Tan, Deputy Director, Centre for Livable Cities, to give us a brief introduction to the panel discussion and to the publication and its link to today's discussion. Ms. Tan, if you will. Thank you, Stella. As Stella has mentioned, this year we mark 30 years since we gazetted the first historic district and URA became the designated conservation authority. Today, much of our urban landscape is, is distinguished by our charming uh, historic buildings and historic sites juxtaposed against the skyscrapers. This is, of course, by no accident, but the result of both the foresight and long-term vision of our urban pioneers, like Mrs. Ko Lim Won Jin, who is with us here today. Most significantly, it is the dedication and partnership of the public, private, and people sectors over the past decades. Our conservation journey is the story of our city, planned and developed as an integrated and collaborative system. The Urban Systems Studies that we're launching today is a series of publications produced by the Centre for Livable Cities to document Singapore's urban transformation and our urban development story. Today, we are pleased to launch our latest, in fact, the 25th uh, USS publication to document the conservation journey and to help us all learn from the past as we think about our future. So I do hope you will find it an insightful read and I would like to thank our collaborators, especially URA, in seeing this book to friction. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan. We will now launch the publication. I would like to invite Mr. Ku Teng Chai, Executive Director of CLC, our moderator, Mr. Kelvin Ang, and our five panelists to come on stage, well, in front of the stage, actually, for the launch of the Urban System Study, Past, Present, and Future, Conserving the Nation's Built Heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could. Thank you. 
we declare the publication officially launched. So complimentary copies of the publication are available at the reception counter. So if you haven't picked up your copy yet, please don't forget to go pick one up before you leave this evening. Thank you, Mr. Ku. May I request for Mr. Ang and the panelists to remain on stage and be seated as we commence our panel discussion. So this afternoon, we'll start off with a panel discussion moderated by Mr. Kelvin Ang, Director, Conservation Management, URA, followed by a question and answer session with the audience. Kindly hold all questions till the Q&A session at the end. Thank you. I will now hand the mic over to our moderator, Mr. Kelvin Ang, to introduce our five panelists. Kelvin, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Selamat datang. Welcome to the Arts House. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to see the house full of enthusiasts and supporters of heritage and culture in Singapore. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our five panellists this afternoon. Although I'm sure many of you know them very well, but I have to give them their due respect <laughs> and they deserve it. So first of all is Ms. Huang Yuning, my Chief Planner. Ms. Huang is currently the Deputy CEO and Chief Planner of the URA and has served in the URA, MND and the Strategy Group of the PM's office. Ms. Huang's experiences include long-term strategic planning, local urban design, master planning, policy development, development and coordination across government. She currently guides URA's land use planning to enhance livability, economic development and future physical capacity and of course conservation. Right. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Ko Lim Jin. This is Mrs. Ko is um, I would say, uh, for many of us, a personal mentor in our journey in becoming planners and architects and conservationists in URA. Um, it's really a great honour to have her here today. She has been instrumental not just in the conservation journey, but shaping Singapore's cityscape through her distinguished career with the URA. As our former Chief Planner and Deputy CEO between 2001 and 2008, she was involved in a variety of high-quality landmark developments which have contributed to Singapore's growth as a global city. I think under her and the team, our conservation program has grown from, well, actually zero buildings <laughs> to 7,000 over buildings today. So thank you very much, Mrs. Koh. <laughs> uh, next is our colleague and dear friend, Dr. Johannes Widodo, um, Associate Professor at the School of Design and Environment, NUS. Uh, Widodo wears many hats. Uh, on top of teaching and research at the NUS, he also specializes uh, specialization in urban history and morpholo morphology of Southeast Asian cities. And of course, uh, in more recent years, about the conservation of our heritage uh, uh, urban environment. He is currently the, the director of the Tun Tan Ching Lok Center for Asian Architectural and Urban Heritage in Malacca, Malaysia, and executive editor of the JSEAA, or the Journal of Southeast Asian Architecture at the Department of Architecture. He is also a founding member and director of ICOMOS Singapore, founded in 2014. Next is uh, a dear colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Chua Elin. I think we met many years ago at the site in the East Coast that was not yet conserved, but is now a wonderful conserved uh, site. She is the VP of the Singapore Heritage Society, a value partner of the journey in Singapore. She is also currently the ED of the SHS, as well as an independent researcher and consultant with substantial experience in academia, the public sector, private consultancy, and civil society. She currently is also a member of the NHB's Project Grant External Evaluation Panel. And of course, she is a mentor to many interesting interns at the SHS who are our next generation of heritage uh, enthusiasts. And finally, we have someone from the practice and more. Uh, you may know Mok Weiwei as a acclaimed architect in Singapore and of course the MD of W Architects and he of course is a very proud product of our NUS Department Architecture from some time ago. He's <laughs> <laughs> he gave a date here but I won't say when. So of course uh, Weiwei's projects have received critical acclaim both locally and internationally and his works have been featured in numerous regional and international publications. In recognition of his contributions to our architectural, architectural scene, he was conferred the President's Design Award in 2007, the nation's highest honour for design. Mr. Wei, Mr. Mok was also a committee member of the SHS from 1995 to 2001 and 
He is also the man behind many successful restorations and revitalizations of our heritage buildings, um, including the one right across the road from uh, the Arts House. So, with this comprehensive introduction to the panel, we have really a group of experts here. Um, I will now invite our panelists to give a short sharing each before we enter a conversation. So, Yuning, please. Yeah. I'm starting to show uh, this, this image that you see here. Yep. This image that you see here is the logo that we started with in the conservation program. So this is about heritage in our hands. I think it's still very, very relevant today in our context. In the heritage journey, we've really seen a lot of people come on board. I mean, the current team, my team and I, we are really building on the work of giants like Mrs. Cole, like Dr. Liu Taika, etc., who have been on the conservation journey. And there are many partners as well, no? early advocates. Like in the book, you'll read about the Friends of Singapore, who way back during the colonial days, they were advocating for some of the um, conservation projects. Our friends from Singapore Heritage Society, they've been partnering us on this journey. So there are a lot of friends that come together and we also rely on the help of the academics as well as practitioners like Weiwei to realize the vision and the ideas that we have when it comes to conserving, adaptively reusing these buildings. So this is still a very relevant theme. And in fact, the hands have grown more because there are more community stakeholders. There are a lot more of you out there that have taken an interest in conservation. But beyond just the interest, we are also trying to raise the standards of our conservation. So it's also about the hands becoming more skillful in the restoration works, uh, which is why we're very pleased that we've partnered up with ICOMOS to start developing these technical guidelines in our, whether it's the conservation advisory panels as well as the heritage uh, panels. We've also gotten a lot of expert views and all that. So Building up the skill sets, the techniques is very important in the work that we do to make sure that we raise the level of restoration works and sensitive restoration as well as new users that come up around it are sensitively placed as well. But beyond skills, beyond the many hands, it's also about embodying conservation and getting the community to love the buildings that we have make use of the buildings that we have. So the community engagement and programming is increasingly an important part of this. So beyond the hands, the heart needs to come in. The love needs to come in, in the restoration work, in the conservation work, in loving the spaces and the places, which is why in recent years, we've placed a lot more emphasis on the programming, on getting the community involved in discussing conservation topics and uh, works as well. So going ahead, I think these are the many areas that we need to continue to work on, and I hope to be able to rely on the many stakeholders that we have in the room as well as beyond to continue to work with us and to get the future generation, as in some of these projects that you see up on the screen, to continue to want to champion conservation, want to be involved in the conservation journey, and to be active participants in the work that we do. Thank you. I have no slides. I will just um, keep to my five minutes. Um, a good afternoon to all of you. Um, I would like to congratulate CLC for their latest publication. Katiana has done a great job. I've read through the entire book. Her coverage is very comprehensive, very well presented and very easy and easy to read, so it's an enjoyable read. So I encourage all of you to read because it took me only 30 minutes to read through the, all the pages. Um, and, and she's here, I'm glad she's here to join us today. She's going to have double happiness because any time she's expected to deliver her first baby. <laughs> and she has delivered the book today. <laughs> I do feel that the publication is very timely 
as we mark the 30 years since we gazetted the first lot of historic districts and buildings for conservation in 1989. However, the journey at URA continued in 1982. A group of passionate architects and planners felt that our city was losing its identity and character and decided to embark on a comprehensive review and study on the need to conserve our built heritage. The success of Singapore's urban conservation journey did not happen by chance. It was carefully planned and designed by a group of URA architects and planners. Um, well, myself included, I was, I mean, 34, 54 years, 34, 44 years back then, you know, I joined URA. Um, our, our team leader was Mr. Gohab Cho. So we worked together in partnership with our service partners and private sector with the strong support of our government. Notwithstanding, it still took us seven years of hard work before we were able to obtain approval to gazette the first lot of historic districts and buildings. And I, I must say, um, the ED of CLC, Mr. Ku Teng Chai, was part of our pillar. In fact, we have to put up paper, you know what you call the paper, to justify <laughs> why do we need to conserve, what's the value, and so on and so forth. So Mr. Ku helped us to put together an excellent paper to the cabinet. Well, the group of us tirelessly go through the whole process, and I must say it was a roller coaster ride. So those of you who is going to champion what's next for the next 30 years, you will enjoy the roller coaster ride. <laughs> because at the end of the next 30 years, you will be here again to launch another book to talk about the success of the next generation of conservation buildings that you are going to um, gazette. Um, you know, we have to pre go through long hours of hard work. Chan Yen, who is here, Tang Keng Ling is here, well, and Lai Yip and so on well, can testify that we work long hours. We have to plan and strategize. It's not just um, identify which building is worthy conservation and go to gazette. You have to really strategize how do you present the case and how do you justify what would be the loss or value gain if we do conservation. So these are the kind of um, work that goes behind the scene. We have to walk the streets, we have to do archival search. We took photographic documentation of each and every building so that we can then also study this building back in the office and um, tirelessly go through the long process of seeking public feedback and approval to turn our plans into reality with a long-term vision in mind. We have to make sure that whatever we conserve is also sustainable. It's not about um, pretty looking building. It is really about social and historical history as well. We stage many public exhibitions and seminars to promote awareness and value of our built heritage to seek buy-in. Because what you see now, the shop houses are all restored. Those of you who may be born, you know, um, um, less, you may be less than 30 years old, uh, you may not have witnessed how dilapidated the shop houses were. And you know, very often when we suggest conservation of these shop houses, everybody will look at us and say, hmm, all these crummy looking dilapidated buildings, why are you conserving them? So we have to really um, do a lot of work, um, do, put out a great exhibition show like the current URA master plan that is on now, with a lot of write-up, a lot of visuals to demonstrate how a crummy looking shop house can be rehabilitated for new users. It need not be the old users, but it could be the new generation of users, but keeping the spirit of the place. 
Um, I'm told that we are given each five minutes, so I will have to quickly end by highlighting eight key factors that contributed to the success of Singapore's urban conservation journey. Well, we were fortunate then. The first one was there was availability of alternative land in Marina Bay and other areas for new intensive developments. The second factor was delay encroachment to historic districts which were planned as the last phase of urban renewal, thanks to the planners before me. The third was a good timing, public interest and awareness coincided with the completion of major development program. The fourth is the comprehensive planning approach that we took. Timely formulation, implementation and completion of a conservation master plan for the entire island within three short years, from 1989 to 1992. The fifth is the government endorsement and commitment. In 1989, legislation was quickly executed, funding of infrastructure works were obtained, and implementation of pilot projects were completed expediently to demonstrate how we could rehabilitate uh, run-down shop houses. The sixth factor is pragmatic and well-coordinated conservation policy that are sustainable. Incentives offered were practical and affordable to the government. The seventh factor is contribution from the private sector and healthy public-private partnership. And the last critical factor is solid professional preparation and dedicated people. So to me, the Singapore conservation journey was really a labour of love. I will end here. Okay, I just continue. For me, conservation is a managing change. So it's not about freezing things. And we know that our uh, Singapore government, Wengin especially, has been doing very well in the last 50 years or over to prepare the Singapore. It's not just uh, for the future, but also to preserve the past. Until four years ago, when we were celebrating the, the SG50, we have a very good instruments. I will try to talk about instruments now to manage this change, which is OneMap.SG. In OneMap.SG, we have a kind of uh, middle platform that's very transparent, initiated by the LTA to show the land ownerships, to show the layers of the present buildings and the layers of the future plan. And you look into the old uh, onemap.sg before the change uh, recently. You see a lot of menu, pull down menu. When you pull down the menu, you can see even the NGOs, uh, whoever can put the layers on there. So we can see very clearly the palimpsest of Singapore. Although there is one thing is missing, the historical layer is not there. So, when we're celebrating the SG50, there is additional layers, which is 1HM, 1H Singapore map, it's a historical map of Singapore. So, it's one step ahead that we are trying to add new layers, but it's not bold enough. It's very cautious. So we don't put the layers as one layers in one map.sg, but instead we separate that one into OHM one map.sg and put the dots. And on that dots, you can click, but you can see it's only pictures from the archive, but not really a map. So this is one step ahead. And then if you look into the year over there, the layers, it's only from 1966 onward. So what happened from 1819, or even from the 15th century Singapore, or the 17, 700 years ago, is not there. But at least there is some step ahead to recognize this one. But recently, if you go back to onemap.sg, so what you see now, the layers are gone. We have this land, SLA has this map with a little bit menu over there, pull down menu, 
but you cannot see the connection of this map with the master plan. URA, move forward with its own map, it's called the URA space, version 2. We have the all flu flats of the information about the past, a little bit about confirmations, but also for the future plan. So for me, I think this is one step backward if you're looking, talking about the future. This is uh, the things that I recently quite used to. We are talking about the layers of the past and about the continuity. The city palimpsest will remain the same from the 14th century, 17th century, 18th century, 20th century, 21st century. So it's a layering process that's going on from time to time. So we cannot detach the planning of the future from the palimpsest of the past. This graphic on your right side is, you know, the dotted line on there is a future planning and development. I mean, this URA space things. While at the bottom, the present situation, recent past historical layer and distant past historical layers, which is still missing from the, our maps. It's almost there, but it's not there now. So UNESCO in 2011 recommended to all the state member countries, especially those who has World Heritage Site on the country, to adopt the instrument called HUL, the Historic Urban Landscape. And the historic urban landscape is basically is a mapping, bottom-up mapping from the community, voices from the ground, to identify significant sites according to the communities and, and vulnerable sites because of climate change, because of the stress of the economic development and so on. So if we put this together in a map that is transparent and we return this map back into one map.sg, and then on that map, we superimpose the future planning. Immediately, we can identify possible tensions, conflicts, and so on. And these conflicts actually is good things if we can detect before it happens. So we need to have this kind of proactive rather than reactive uh, in terms of managing change in Singapore. So if there is a conflict, then we have another mechanism called heritage impact assessment. We already have environmental impact assessment. We should be able to have another one, cultural impact assessment, or heritage impact assessment, equal to the environmental impact assessment. And we can restart the so-called the Singapore conversations. So Singapore conversation should be another mechanism that bring people together as a family to address the future of Singapore. So, if you're looking into the Singapore 100, towards Singapore 100, this is the job or belong to the 5G Singaporeans. I'm part of 4G, some of us is from 3G, and the babies there will be the 6G. So the future is belong to them. So in this future, the millennials has a different way of looking things. We are entering the era of transparency, a new era of democracy, the new era of big data, the new era of social media. So if we are not become a transparent ourselves, so we cannot continue to have the same Singapore, the past into the future. So in order to do that, I think, in my opinion, we need to see things in totality. It's not just to see what is happening now, but you also need to understand what it is in the past and how to bring all this together, like layers in Photoshop, like layers in AutoCAD, like layers in, in, in uh, whatever software, into the future. And second, it has to be democratic. I mean, it's not just top-down process, it's not just bottom-up, but a strategic alliance, a conversation of all the stakeholders. And then it has to be transparent because we value accountability. Singapore is incorruptible. Speculations, yes, we can have a speculations, but it has to be managed carefully. And then if we have totality, democracy, and transparency, we will have stability. 
and stability is the prerequisite for growth. And then, if we have stability, we can ensure continuity. And by that, so we can be quite optimistic that we can face SC100 with more optimism, with a stronger mechanism that is fit into the next era that we are going to, to go. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Aileen, and I'm from the Singapore Heritage Society. So I'm here to present to you the civil society perspective on our topic today. But listening to our previous speakers, I'm so happy to hear a lot of the key words that will come up in my presentation as well. Um, just to start off, I'm sure all of you have been looking at the new URA draft master plan, and you'll probably be looking at the section on rejuvenating familiar places. That's the most obvious one that relates to conservation and heritage. But today I'd like to maybe draw your attention to another category that's in the master plan on livable and inclusive communities. And if you ask me what's next for conservation, I think that's the category that's really important. It's some of the things that, that um, the previous speakers have brought up about how uh, we need to engage communities and future generations. So, first of all, I'd just like to introduce to you a formula. It's a formula that I like to use when I'm thinking about placemaking. That's something that's also very important in the master plan. And the master plan describes placemaking as a, a better management of places to create a better environment. For me, placemaking is really a combination of a few things. It's about place, yes, but also people, function, or the uses of the place that people do there, and how that develops over the span of time. And time is where it becomes heritage and history, because all these things grow together and develop over time. And I'd just also like to draw your attention to, uh, if you can see the very small words on my slide, the, this definition that I have comes from Janet Pillay. She's um, from Malaysia, and she's written a really excellent book on cultural mapping called Cultural Mapping, A Guide to Understanding Place, Community, and Continuity. So I recommend all of you to have a look at that book if you want to uh, go into these ideas a bit more. Okay, so just to move on, what I thought I'd do for you in my slides today is just throw up a few examples uh, for maybe we can take them up in the discussion later. The examples that relate to some of our recent Singapore Heritage Society projects. And also a couple of them I hope will be familiar to those of you working in URA and MND because they're in your neighborhood. This, I'm sure, might look familiar to many of you who work in the Tanjong Paga area. This is the Seng Wong Bio Temple, which was founded in 1905. As you can see, it's set, uh, stated very clearly on the side of the temple. Uh, the Tanjong Paga area has undergone a lot of changes. This old temple is surrounded by many tall new developments. Um, and for me, this is a local anchor in the, in the vicinity. It's places like this, historical sites like this, are a link to our past, and they're an anchor in a space that's changing a lot. But it's not just about the place, as I've mentioned. What happens in a place of worship like this is you've got a function that's been going on there for more than 100 years, in situ, the same place, the same function, reaching out to the same community. So that's the kind of continuity that's very special in Singapore. We don't often see that. This is an example also from around the Maxwell Tanjong Paga area. This is Sia Tien Hung Buddha Shop. It's the last effigy carving workshop in Singapore. Some of you may have seen it in the press. They also run tours on Airbnb experiences. And those are some of the ways in which this family has been trying to find a sustainable future for what they're doing. This shop started out on Ansiang Hill, right down from URA. It's now Senso Italian Restaurant. There's a historic marker plaque outside. You'll see this shop mentioned in the plaque there. They're now in, in, in um, uh, Tanjong Paga, just behind the um, Jin Rickshaw Station. But you can see in the photo, you can see the grandmother here, which is my... Which, uh, this is the grandmother, Madam Tan. She's 88 years old. That's her great-granddaughter, and that's her grandson, who is trying to come up with a new business plan, a sustainable future for their biz family business. So they've been in the area a long time, and this is the kind of intangible heritage, a kind of local business, traditional traits that continue in the area. So it's not just about the buildings as a shell, but what's inside them 
that carries on that, his, that heritage and tradition. My next example. This is a very different place, very, very far away from downtown Singapore. Any ideas where this is? It's on Pulau Ubin, exactly. This is Pulau Ubin. It's another one of our Singapore Heritage Society projects. And what I want to show you here, this is Madame Noria next to her former home on Ubin, 818K Kampung Surau. Well, there's nothing left there now. Recently, her son, Shazwan, went to find the ruins of their old family home, which is now in the jungle in Pulau Ubin. But I put here future dreams. Madam Noria has many memories and dreams of her past home on Pulau Ubin, but she has dreams for the future, that she may be able to go back to Pulau Ubin, that she may once again have a house there. And how might this be possible? You know, uh, um, for, for Ubin, many agencies, MND, uh, URA, and parks, um, and many community groups like Singapore Heritage Society have been involved in the Friends of Ubin project. And for us in SHS, What's important about Friends of Ubin, it's really about the community. These are the former residents of Kampong Sungai Durian and Kampong Surau. This was a reunion that Madam Noria's son held for them a few months ago. And to us, they are the custodians of heritage. This, the location here, this is Pak Ahmad's um, drink stall, Pak Ahmad's warung. And he's been living in this house for a long time. He's the custodian not only of this building, he brings his family stories to it that give it meaning. But when it comes to Madame Noria thinking of rebuilding her old home, these custodians of heritage on Bula Ubin have the intangible knowledge to rebuild old kampong houses. And that in itself is something that's part of our heritage and very precious. But to me, it's a sign that even when um, the physical is gone, people, the knowledge they have, can rebuild that with that intangible heritage, intangible knowledge. Um, so I think for me, at the end of the day, there's the built heritage, but there's also the community and the people behind that that give it that depth and knowledge. Um, and so just to end with the same word that Johannes ended with, it's about continuity uh, through all this. And I would say that continuity also leads to Resilience for a community is not just the bonds that we have between different communities and different groups, but the bonds across generations and your sense of yourself in time, that you are part of something that's been going on for decades or maybe over 100 years. You go and pray at a place, that, a place of worship that has been around for 150 years. That gives you a very different sense of yourself. Okay, and I will end there. Thank you very much. afternoon. But as a practicing architect, I mean my focus will be uh, my experience of uh, doing conservation projects in Singapore. You know, from the, I'm old enough to remember uh, when we still had to, um, uh, when shop houses were not uh, uh, kept uh, until about mid-80s, you know. Uh, but we are fortunate, I think, uh, once that decision is made, we as a practitioner, I think we have a uh, benefit of using a set of guidelines that was very quickly established. I think that's very useful so that we know how to um, have a certain kind of uh, standards to respond to when coming to restoring these uh, or keeping these buildings. But as um, you have heard, you know, time never stands still. And even, they, even, even if we are talking about conservation today, you know, the situation keeps changing. Um, of course, we have the success of a uh, conserving near to 7,000 shop houses, I would say, mainly, you know. But even with that kind of track record, I think uh, there's still a lot of uh, rooms for improvement in terms of quality. Um, how these shop houses are kept over time, you know, from um, a, a less sort of... Uh, polished uh, set of guidelines where even concrete floors are permitted in the, in the construction of shop houses to later on how these are refined and then uh, became more pure as using uh, timber floors. You know, all these uh, take times to evolve and also we look at some of the shop houses that are a sort of standard solutions nowadays. Um, you mainly just keep the facade and inside is a totally modern sort of environment. 
and, and then uh, whether today we begin to question, you know, that that is sufficient for the conservation of these uh, historic structures, you know. So time never stands still, and our perception, our sense of quality change, and I think that's good. We have a fairly sort of, uh, at least we have started the past 30 years, you know, uh, 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 we have managed to come so far, and um, I believe URA will continue to refine that set of guidelines. Uh, and uh, so the new issues come out. Have we conserved too many shop houses? Is it time to stop? You know, how about moving on to other buildings of other periods? Because time never stands still, as I say. You know, they are the, 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 the so-called modern building of the past is now vintage. And there are pressing issues about the conservation of uh, different eras of, uh, of uh, built environment and, as well as memories. Um, I will use a few slides to, to, to sort of illustrate, even for the design of buildings, how the architects uh, use new things to respond to the old also um, evolves over time. How do I? I just press it. Okay, so you can see this is Raffles Hotel, 1991. I would say fairly early period of the of uh, conservation in Singapore. And uh, you look at this part of the Raffles Hotel is actually it looks like an old building, but it's actually a new a new building. You know, so at that time, I think the perception is that uh, if, you, if you conserve, then you have to use totally same sort of historical language to respond to the old. You know, so, I mean, uh, then there were talks about, uh, this is another example, 1991 to 1996 is Chimes. You know, Chimes, this particular building is actually a new building, but it looks like old, you know. So, that was the kind of uh, perception of quality at that point. Then, of course, later on, the people say that, no, why should new look like old? Why can't new look like new and respond to old, you know? And therefore, by the time I did this building in the mid-2000, which is the National Museum's extension, uh, worldwide, it is very established that new should be uncompromisingly new and uh, to contrast, you know, in a very distinct way with the old. And so, this was built at that time. Then, by the time I move on to this other building, which is finished in 2014, recently, Victoria Theatre, we began to, if you look at this uh, facade, you know, this is, a, this is an old Victoria Concert Hall facade, and this is the theatre side of the facade. The theatre facade actually was completely erased already in the 1950s, and we had to rebuild this facade with arcade behind and all that, to recapture that kind of spatial quality. But our response has by then moved on oops, sorry, uh, to using something of a similar kind of, uh, I would say, cement and plaster kind of material, you know, and uh, looking fairly close to the original masonry and uh, plaster kind of material, but distinguishing the new from the old in more subtle ways, like this is actually using precast concrete, you know, the, the, the ornaments are less pronounced, they are flattened, they have become incisions on the facade. And um, this is nothing, this is something that we actually uh, also sort of follow the trends of how people perceive modernity and how modernity should uh, react to uh, 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 the, his the historic part of the structures. So, for instance, this ex example in uh, Paris, um, there was this is the new part that they added, you know, um, but it's um, completely replicating the neoclassical building of the, the style, but again using precast concrete. And then um, it's, um, it's actually, I think, before was an apartment, and then now it's converted into a hotel. And what is signaling the new are actually the windows, like this, because the module has shifted, you know, so the new window actually. Um, uh, juxtaposed with the old sort of uh, module of the facade. I'm sorry. In a contrasting, but then you see the the the, the main body of the of the of the of the building is um, very subtly contrasting with the with the old. Now this is another example in uh, Britain. This is a castle which was burned actually and became uh, like a ruin, you know. And then the, um, the local council commissioned uh, architect to turn this into a sort of holiday house. 
And the way he has added the new is using almost the same material, brick, load bearing, but contrasting it with sharper details. You know, so it's, uh, you can see the, the, the differences is, is there, but then it, is, it suggests greater uh, continuity. Now, this is a new um, museum in Basel. Um, it's actually an extension of an old museum. You know, but you can see an architect here again uses traditional material, brick load bearing, but in his uh, expression of the traditional material, the heaviness of it, you know, uh, correspond with the datum of the old building and uh, is detailed in such a way which is um, unmistakably modern. But in terms of the building, the massiveness of the weight and all that, it is already moving away from a kind of light structure, you know, steel and uh, aluminium. And uh, this is another example that shows that what we can do in terms of uh, improving the quality of our conservation project I mean, we have always established this principle of the three R. I can't remember exactly what it is. It's retain, re repair, retain, and recycle, right? Something. And restore, okay. Yeah. Anyway, there is, a, there is a very high sort of a standard that is set from very beginning, but I think in the practice of it, we don't really push it to its limit, you know? So a lot of things actually gut it out and then build a new and all that. So, if you look at this project, actually they do that, you see. This is actually a um, theatre building uh, named after Samuel Peckett, you know, in uh, Barcelona. And um, wherever they can, you know, every bit of the patina of the building of that is kept. At the same time, they do uh, quite a, a sort of bold uh, a transformation of the space. So the, the voice that you see here, you know, these are all new cutouts. So the architect is able to introduce very sort of quite bold kind of intervention to open up the space where it's necessary, but at the same time, keep the material and the patina of the building as much intact as possible. So I will end with a quote from, um, not a quote, I mean I will just uh, read out what the magazine, a very famous, uh, 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 a very established magazine like the Domus, Italian magazine, what, how they describe this project. You know, they say these projects, the new additions, adopted a somewhat ambiguous poetic and style, not easily distinguishable from the original parts of the historic construction. In this sense, their modernity avoided introducing a clear distinction between old and new, opting instead for a slight detachment that created additions without a loss of continuity. So I'll end that and uh, we can uh, hopefully it's give you some sort of talking points later. Thank you. Thank you all of you for really sharing this uh, a very broad perspective of the almost the entirety of the world of conservation and preservation. I think what's really quite clear is that we have moved beyond just looking into the physical transmission of heritage through buildings and sites into the future, but the intangible aspects of what does it mean for now and the future how do we actually make meaning and how do we push the envelopes in even physical projects and management in order to have sustainable, a uh, sustainable program. So if I may, I thought I might just um, ask um, the panel members some questions and you could respond to each other um, if, if you like. And then we have a bit of conversation here. And subsequently, I'll open it to the floor for your questions as well. So. Uh, Unique. So you have been with URA for um, quite a bit of time, looking at from both planning and now um, at the local level and at the national level. Um, what do you think really would be um, the upcoming challenge for this uh, in this area of, of identity or culture? And perhaps for the rest of the panel members as well, um, 
what you think are the challenges in terms of identity and culture because it's such a nebulous subject in, in, in a way. In a very complex, multi-ethnic, multicultural Singapore, everyone has different understanding. So. I think one of the key challenges would be to really work closely with the community, the local stakeholders. And I think sometimes there's also a challenge about identifying who the relevant local stakeholders are. Are these the visitors to the space? Are these the tenants? Are these the landlords? Is it all of us? So, so that's also a, a journey for us to try and uncover and understand who the relevant stakeholders are. How do we work closely with them to try and strengthen their, their understanding of the cultural identity of the place? Can we come in to facilitate? Or do they prefer a more hands-off approach where it goes and develops more organically? So, so these are things that we are struggling with. I think for, for our teams like Kelvin and a, a lot of the conservation colleagues and even the place management, placemaking colleagues, they're now a lot more in touch with the community on the ground to try and understand and suss out this part uh, of it. So, so that's uh, something that we're struggling with. But I think increasingly, we are also seeing the response from the community to engage us in such dialogues as well. So, so it's very encouraging as well. I think talking about the community is very interesting because we are talking about fluid. Mm. It's keep changing yeah. and keep moving forward. So, but we have um, a hope that because of harvesting in the big data can give us a hint, actually. So what is really the, the sentiments from the ground? Well, you are already working together with Grab, for example, to look into the traveling pattern. You can also use the same things by harvesting from Facebook, hashtag, check-ins, tweets, uh, about the certain sentiments on, that you can put on the maps. And then we can pin down where is the hot spot uh, in Singapore, just using uh, argo um, some, some algorithms. So I think that is uh, thanks to the technology. Maybe the next step is the research on, on how to do the filtering, how to separate garbage from the relevant information. Then we can identify the hotspots in the different areas even before it happened. Yeah. I'd like to offer a, a different perspective, and a, a different way we can and look at this. And um, with regards to com communicating with the stakeholders, what we've learned from our Pula Urban experience is how important it is to speak in a language that uh, they express themselves best in. So by that, I mean really physically, the, actually the language, whether it be Chinese, Malay, or even dialects, not Mandarin, but dialects. But also um, in, in language in the sense of we often, um, we know how we are used to certain administrative processes, applying for things online, licenses, and all that. And it's a huge challenge for them. Not only uh, uh, they, may not, they can probably just have a handphone, if at all. And uh, I've had experience with some of the elderly residents there, even struggling to sign their name or write their IC number. So having them understand what's going on and, and um, really requires, I think, a big shift in terms of how uh, uh, often our, our city processes work. Uh, so I think that that's a challenge for, for all of us too. I also present another perspective of challenges. Um, my concern will be having conserved and protected all the historic districts. How do we, um, what do we need to do? How do we ensure the continuity of character and charm of these historic districts? I mean, we can talk, as Yuning said, we have to know who are the stakeholders. To me, one important key stakeholders for historic districts will be the landlord. Um, I've been out of URA for 10 years now. Looking from the outside, I observe that the um, property value and rental value of historic district, the shop houses, has been increasingly very rapidly. Um, when, when we first started the first phase of sales for shop house, each shop house, you can buy one before restoration for 150000 or 180000 <coughs> But now, each shop house, I don't know, 10, 15 million. 
Now, if the property value goes up, the rental value goes up, naturally, um, you can't sort of continue to achieve the differentiated kind of mixed uses that gives each of these historic districts the character and charm. So I have no solution to that, but I do observe that these historic districts are zoned as commercial zone. They are not subjected to any restrictions. They are not subjected to any cooling measures. So therefore, it gets very hot and, and it doesn't get cool. <laughs> <coughs> so, so I think maybe the relevant authorities and ministry may wish to take a closer look and see what is necessary, what we need to do so that the value don't keep increasing and um, you know, um, users that adds charm and character to the place do get eroded over time. And I also do feel 30 years have gone by. Um, perhaps we also need a proactive approach to ensure that um, owners do not carry out unauthorized addition and alteration works without us in the know. I mean, that was what happened, you know. Um, 40, 40, 50 years ago and that's why the conservation shop houses you can see all the back lanes were all you know, cluttered out with additional add-ons the facades were changed the signages are all over the place and so on and so forth um, so on and off I do drive around these historic districts um, so if I see something, I still sort of alert URA. <laughs> <laughs> Just a response to Mrs. Cole. Um, you know, some of the, I think some of the audience may not know that some of the core historic districts, we do manage the trade mix and we disallow, for instance, fast food restaurants to be some of these core areas. So there's some level of trying to maintain a certain character. But certainly, I take Mrs. Cole's point that beyond that, we also need to look at whether there are additional layers of management that we need to uh, build in to maintain certain um, types of mixes and traits, etc. Uh, the other thing I want to just respond to in terms of opportunities to inject certain types of users. Within the historic districts, we do have uh, state-owned properties as well as state land that's still available. And in this draft master plan, we put out the notion that for some of these state properties and land, we do want to work with the local stakeholders to jointly come together and think about what is a more appropriate use that can go in there. And then through the, this type of uh, lease arrangements, we may try and bring some of that uh, users in to these local areas. Of course, it cannot be every state property is uh, guided this way, but there are some key properties that we're looking at. For instance, the Southern's Gate, uh, some of the properties there and some of the state land in Little India and state properties in Hindu Road, that there's opportunity for us to come in with the stakeholders to, in a way, guide the users a little bit more and hopefully provide a platform and opportunity for suitable community and cultural users to come in. Could I ask for a clarification you know, on the, the, this, exactly this section in the master plan? When, when I read it, it seemed to be quite... Uh, commercially driven in the sense that it says you want to work with architects and, and, and businesses to uh, come up with uses for, for these state buildings and it seemed, they seem to be still quite market driven. I think you may be looking at different portions of mm -hmm. the draft master plan. There were some within the historic districts that are meant for more community, culture and working with the stakeholder type. I was looking at the SLA section. There are the other parts mm -hmm. that, for instance, within the Marina Bay area, Similarly, for state-owned uh, properties and land, they would be more commercially driven because mm -hmm. we're looking more at uh, infusing the right type of users in those locations, mm -hmm. lifestyle users, etc. Mm -hmm. So different locations will call for different types of strategies. Mm -hmm. And I think that going forward, there are opportunities to work with stakeholders to think through what are the users. But I think end of the day, that the use itself also need to have some element of viability as well for the operator, uh, whoever that may be. So that's also an important consideration. Yeah. I, 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 think, uh, I think part of the 
conversation that we're observing here is really just, uh, I would say, a kind of creative tension between past, future, continuity, uh, what we have done and what we wish to transmit to the future. And of course, the people who are inheriting the program. Many of you here are very young. I'm, I think we're very happy to see, to see a lot of young people in this, in, this, in this house. And you will inherit this program. So whatever we have done or we're doing is for you and your future generations. So within this ideal of passing of the future, um, in the past 20 years, I've also noticed some of these tensions about the best use, the best way of keeping something. I mean, say for example, way way in your projects for the few state buildings like the Victoria uh, Memorial Hall and, 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 and theatre, by reopening the long overlooked central atrium as a child, remember this is a very dingy space. We have created a new place that is a civic space for new memories to be made. Just like how this chamber through our integrated arts and cultural planning has gone from a very closed public building, because of security, etc., to a very open public building where you can now make your memories here. So this kind of very everyday living heritage environment is, of course, the ideal. But how about the very uh, rare and precious old traits that we try to sustain? How do we best do that? Or there I said, what may be important to young people here? What is your heritage? So if I may provoke all of you, as in one way, um, Do you think that it is okay to have, it's okay, I have to ask this, a fast food restaurant in the middle of a heritage area? Why or why not? Just a couple of thoughts. This has been uh, something that's been being fed to us at work for quite some time, so I thought, and maybe I could ask for a vote as well later. Or should you ask for a vote first? Okay. All right. So I will post to the house how many of you would be open to the idea of a fast food restaurant being located in a heritage street. Hands up. Okay, so it's about half. Can you, um, can I seek a clarification? Ah, yes. You're talking, about, you're talking about the core of historic district or any outside part? the core, any part? Uh, maybe any part. Any part including the core? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, all Hands right. Up. Hands up. Okay, so okay, hands up again, including the very central parts of, of our area. Hands up. Hands up. <coughs> okay, so, so I ask this question because um, it is one thing that keeps coming back to us. Can I give my view? Mm. <laughs> yes. Get it in 1989, <coughs> I was responsible in formulating the conservation guidelines. And we have a plan like the Greater Chinatown for all the four sub-areas. Each and every area, we identify a historic... No, in fact, each of the historic districts, we identify streets, what we call as the core of the, central, core of the conservation area. <coughs> Why? Because these core are what historically um, known to the um, people at large, it's important. You go to the core, you can get certain things and so on and so forth. So we mark it in red colour on the plan and we have a list of um, uses that are not allowed. Other than that, not allowed list, everything else is allowed, but we encourage um, traditional use, of course. And of course, one of the not allowed items was fast food or knockout, Western fast food or knockout furniture store. Um, well, 40 years has gone by, or 30 years has gone by. I hold different views now. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I, I think perhaps there's nothing wrong to have a Western fast food even within the core of the historic districts. But then we need to have guideline McDonald. You're not about to have a big M that goes over the whole front facade. And maybe we can limit the number of non-traditional uses within the core. But it need not be 100%, you know. Uh, when I use the word traditional, uh, it's not really traditional, traditional in the real sense. Uh, I should say uses that contribute to the ethnic charm of the districts. You know, in fact, you go to Chinatown, a lot of new users, they contribute to the Chinese-ness. 
Little India, I did not expect it to be so Indian, you know. <laughs> Back 30 years ago, if you go there, it's really full of the population there. You have a lot of Indians and the trades, the garland, the garland flower seller, the spices and so on, still continue because there is demand. So anything that is still in demand, it will continue to thrive. But there's nothing wrong if we allow some of these um, extraordinary uses to come in in the core. Thank you. How about um, other views on the panels? So I guess everything can. <laughs> but there is one word that is to be cautious, which is appropriateness. Mm. Whether it's appropriate or not. One example like Chimes, the chapel, and then you organize Halloween with these anti-Christians, mocking the archbishop who stayed across the road. So the kind of appropriateness, the ethical aspect, is, should, should be something that guides us in whether we can, can or not. But everything can, even McDonald's. You see it in, J in Japan, in different places. You can see even Starbucks sit in nicely in the machia. In China also, we see all these new typologies and it's become like a, a, a new um, trademark for, for the business. So this appropriateness is important, I think. I think we need a definition for appropriateness. When you mentioned chimes, I have to tell you a story about chimes. <coughs> we restricted the chapel to appropriate cultural related kind of uses and of course it it, it took off, but soon after the completion of the rest of, no, when we said that the, I think we, I can't remember now, uh, I think the old girls of convent was very um, concerned that we allow commercial users to be in the chapel itself. So they persuaded us and say no commercial use should be allowed. So we say fine, we can do that. But immediately soon after the chapel was restored and the whole chimes was launched, the old girls were the first to come to URA and say, can we hold our reunion old girls dinner in the chapel? Now, isn't that commercial use? F and B. So, appropriateness, we can debate endlessly as well. Mm. I think that's what's interesting about this subject. Wait, wait. I think the, it's very difficult to retain the lifestyle if that lifestyle is already changed. I think today you look at the historic districts, it, Little India has the most sort of uh, Indian characteristic because somehow the lifestyle there still continue. You know, the kind of trade and all that. So, so they are still there because people still live that life. Whereas in some parts of uh, Chinatown, for instance, you know, I must say Chinatown, you see, when we started a conservation try, a movement trying to encourage uh, conservation, we had to give incentive, right? Therefore, the original mixed-use character of com commerce below and living upstairs um, was rezoned to totally commercial, you know, because commercial is more valuable. And that is like a, a kind of incentive for people to want to restore their building because the value is already enhanced. But at that point, we did not take a more difficult path of also trying to retain the traits. And perhaps, understandably, it is very difficult, you know, especially some of the traits are really dying traits, you know. How many people still buy a lantern, for instance, you know? or lion mask and all that. You know. so, so, so these are very delicate issues and it's not easy to, to, to sort of um, make them into museums. Mm. And we, we just have to, to me, I think one way to manage the change nicely is actually to, um, now I think it's the appropriate time to talk about it because after 20 years, we, we, have, we have kept the shell and we are now in a position to see how to make the quality of the environment in terms of usage and all that uh, more uh, compatible, you know. And I think people want that. People, whether it's a young or old generations, you know, the, the aspiration for a more quality environment is there, you know. And people, I think, can accept now that if there's certain uh, imposition of restrictions, 
even in terms of dollar and cents, you know, you make less money. I think people maybe can 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 see in a sort of longer term and accept that. And I think one way for this to happen is actually to encourage that place to form a certain kind of associations or, or, or a group, mm. this ground initiated group, you know, and who has a real interest in keeping the, the place nice and vibrant and with diversity and all that. And this group of people, they can then together set their own uh, standards, you know, and they can help the police, so to speak, you know, whether this use is appropriate or not appropriate. And I think this is very good. It's very difficult for the government to actually stipulate everything. Mm. And I think it's time now for the grounds to actually uh, take on initiative to help to make that a, a better place. I think this thing about the uh, issue of appropriateness, the participation of, of communities on the ground, and then the role of the state agency as a facilitator perhaps, or as the honest broker between different parties to resolve um, some of these tensions. Um, in our daily work, I think we are now playing that role. I think but what's interesting is that uh, uh, growing the ground or talking to the ground has been an interesting challenge because there are such diverse views. And I think in both conservation and planning, the public servant is both a facilitator and also a leader in some ways because, um, as Mrs. Ko said, 40 years ago, crummy shop houses, why are you keeping it? You know? um, but you know, there was a vision and the value has been realised. So that leadership role, I think, is a challenging one for anyone in the profession. You know, all of us are professionals. How do we persuade the public that our vision is correct? And then subsequently, how do we facilitate uh, this discussion about com coming on board. Authenticity, relevance, lifestyle, young people these days, um, I miss the panel about nostalgia, etc. And, and that, um, they're all about the Instagrammable moment, the, uh, the $10 cafe lattes and all that. Those are the things that, that, that make money. Uh, it happens in my neighbourhood. I live in Tiong Bahru. It's, uh, I'm so grateful the coffee shop is still downstairs and not a $10 cafe latte shop. But I accept that the $10 cafe does make Tiong Bahru more inclusive and more accessible to a new generation of Singaporeans and tourists who want to see a part of Singapore. So it's really about that balance, about um, how much for local people and how much for the new community, and then what is appropriate based on historical understanding of the neighbourhood. And I think in this part about historical understanding, be it uh, architecture or be it place management, then research is most important because you are going into this uh, depth of, of discovery and analysing say, okay, these are things that we should be aware of, that on a day-to-day -day basis we might not be aware of. But I think that conservation of the shell is really a precursor to uh, unlocking and, in fact, buying time for a lot more research. Um, I think if we had not conserved things 30 years ago, we would be so much poorer now because we wouldn't have the sites to trigger the research to bring out the diversity and the richness of what this island has to offer us as a foundation for the future. Eileen, you had something to say. I, well, my, my thoughts on the fast food restaurant. Mm. I think we've already got so many expensive European restaurants in, in, in our <laughs> historic districts that uh, why not a fast food restaurant? At least that will make it more inclusive to a different socioeconomic range as well. I think you know, the idea you mentioned of being inclusive is very important that um, our cultural and historical assets don't become just uh, uh, something that only people who are, who are well-to-do can enjoy. There should be something where, where for all Singaporeans to, to, to be able to access. I think in this field, uh, the state can play its role in creating uh, an array of assets that are inclusive by being free to the citizens. So, for example, please, please, please visit our museums because they are free to you as a citizen. <laughs> this is a major, major, I would say, uh, policy that our culture is free to citizens. It's very important, you know, but it wasn't always the case, right? Uh, but how about private sites? I was sharing with Mrs. Ko that, uh, you know, in Arab Street, there is still one basket shop there today because the tenant who runs it has a heart to keep that one basket ware shop as part of his portfolio, even though it doesn't make him really the money because it says, how can Arab Street have a basket ware shop? I've been here for 50 years. But he can do that because the landlord is a family friend and they know him for 60 years and they say, well, he's an old friend, we trust him, you know, it's a good deal. There is enough. 
So these outcomes, I think the state cannot really intervene, but all of us can be there to persuade, you know, that kind of micro-philanthropy, I suppose, you know, patronage. Yeah, we can, well, we can encourage Ruth Ting Hao. Okay, brainstorm. Um, so, where next, I think, really is the question. Perhaps I can open to the floor? And then, so, I've opened the floor now. Uh, do keep your questions uh, concise. Uh, do give us your name and where you're from. And, yes, hands up and the mics can... Ah, there's one there, the gentleman at the back. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Edward. Uh, I also attended yesterday LTA lecture. Uh, I wasn't there, sorry. <laughs> Edward. Okay. I, I, I agree with the middle gentleman, he said about appro appro appropriateness. Uh, because uh, a few years ago, I strolled down the Taylor Ayer Road, uh, street, uh, Taylor Ayer street uh, the shop house. They are doing some restoration work, and the heritage board the officer is also at the, at the scene. Then I, I, told, I told them that the shop house, uh, you know, there's two horns, uh, concrete horns uh, coming out from the shop house, the front. Uh. Actually, that, that horns uh, is for hanging the Chinese lantern. No? Mm -hmm. For hanging the Chinese lantern for good luck, no? for opening of the, the shop, the business. No? But now, uh, you see all the shop house, uh, all the pubs, uh, they are hanging all their lo uh, the, the signboard logo uh, on top of the horns. Uh, or the uh, uh, awning or what, you know, on top. No? So this is uh, not appropriate, you know, it's, it's misuse of the, the cultural uh, feature, you know. Uh, if you don't hand Chinese lantern, maybe it's, uh can think of uh, what other use. It's not misuse and, and, and you put your logo up there and then, you know. Uh. Okay, thank so you. So I told the heritage officer, he said, I don't know, I have to feedback to my authority. Uh. He's uh. a good officer, he'll take it so, back but to the they, office. They didn't, feedback, <laughs> they didn't reply back to me. I see. What, what happened next? You know? So okay. sir, what, what would you like to be done differently? in future? Mm, no, because, you know, the horns uh, is very light type of uh, concrete, no? the feature, concrete feature. No? So if you hang the logo, you can see some of them, the logos are uh, very heavy. You know? It's already oh, adding weight, yeah. load uh, on the concrete. The horns uh, is going slanting down already. You know? It's going to fall off very soon. Okay, uh, uh, so we the will... So or the you know, heritage spot should take note. No? You know, it should... So, so can we look for you after the break? Because I want to know what this case is, because okay, it's okay. quite important. Uh -huh. But actually what he shared is quite important. Sometimes a lot of details on the ground, in the rush to do our work every day, uh, we don't know everything. A lot of what I know today has been told to me by my seniors. So the moment we learn something new about a site that's historic, then our duty is to try to record it and then put the word out of how to do things better. So let me look for you after this, okay, okay. and we will... Settle that one. Thank and you. Thank you. The second thing is, I feel conservation or heritage uh, mm. is for promoting the Singapore style. Because I went to overseas for projects. Uh, everyone told me, wow, your Singapore shop house, very sweet. Bagus. You know? So, er, so we should not, uh, heritage not to conserve, not to, to, to continue on to the future. Is we should promote the Singapore style, to, to, you know, in, in Singapore and overseas, you know. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Um, maybe maybe we will take another question before we ask. Yes. It was a sharing, but thank you for sharing. My name is James. I'm a retired project manager. I had conserved some shop houses in Purvis Street uh, many years ago, and the development behind the shop shop houses were five-story apartments which yield a lot of uh, income for the landlord and therefore the uh, front shops could have uh, shops with a lower block ratio. Now, I just want to share with you a comment I heard from a Hong Kong friend. He says your much uh, valued temples in Singapore you call them Chinese temples. You don't know how to renovate Chinese temples. That's what the Hong Kong man to told me. Because he, he mentioned some outstanding Chinese temples 
in Hong Kong. Do we at all consult Hong Kong architects? When we restore Chinese temples, really authentic restoration of Chinese temples? Or are we just short of budget? And uh, how, how could you replace a swallowtail for the roof of the Chinese temple? I don't know, you, you got to put the money in. A swallowtail is a swallowtail. And such craftsmen do not exist in Singapore. Maybe I can just respond to that. Thank you. I think for the temples that are uh, and any of our historic buildings, no? the, the, especially the monuments, there's a lot of care into the restoration and we do have experts. And there's quite a few restorations that have also won UNESCO awards, mm. recognized for the restoration works. The craftsmen are brought in from the relevant places to do the works for the restoration. So I think uh, I'm not sure about consulting the Hong Kong experts because we have our own local experts, like Professor Yeo is in the house, Kang so is there. Is a very renowned uh, restoration in Chinese temples, etc. Um, and I think we know what to do. Huh? <laughs> mm. and, and the owners do bring in skilled craftsmen from China even. So, so we, we make sure that it is, um, the URA makes sure that they are properly restored. And the monuments bought as yeah, well. And the monuments bought as well. Sorry, yes, lady at the back there. If you, if you would shout louder for the rest of the house. Hi, I'm Serene. I'm a content lead at a real estate consultancy. My question is really about the public-private partnership. Is it really the best model for conservation of our buildings? Because I live in the east and every time I take the bus, I look at Aristo at Amber, it just looks weird. It's like what we say Aristo in local parlance. Like it's not here nor there. So... Oh, you mean the butterfly house that yes. I built? Maybe yeah. I can answer that question. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. okay. So, the I mean, going forward, yeah. is this the model that yeah. URA will continue or is there a better way we can make um, use of these buildings? I think, uh, I think maybe I will just share a little bit before the panel response about the bigger issue of public-private partnership. I think for the butterfly house, there is a chapter in Lily Kong's book that talks about how it came to be. And some would say that it is uh, really not ideal, and some would say it's the best out of a very tough situation. But the um, interesting thing was that uh, we were there at the beginning, and it was such a strange situation because the family that helped the house sold it and moved away. And then another branch of the family said, please keep it. But the buyer who bought the land had bought it, you know, um, for the purpose of redevelopment. It was a very, very tight site. So, what is the fairer solution for everybody? It was a very tough situation, and then we end up with this uh, rather strange hybrid. Some would say, oh, it's not very good. Why do it? But sometimes in life, we, as humans, we learn. Some lessons are not so pleasant, and then we improve. So I, I think in any program, in any partnership, we have to accept that we have our highs and we have our things that we can do better. So... Um, I urge you to, 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 to read that, uh, that chapter. But I guess in planning around the world, it is very important for planners to know how to use private money for public good because it is not really sustainable for any planning system to really just use public money in all aspects. And I'm not sure if it's healthy as well. I mean, uh, would the panellists have some views about the right private par public partnership? I think um, it's definitely not sustainable if it's all about public funding. You know, I think that, that formula, um, I don't think it is uh, applied anywhere. Um, so I think for Singapore here, of course, we are very aware that people shouldn't lose money eh, if we slam a conservation status on it. And sometimes maybe um, we can step back and as we now pursue better quality conservation programs and all that. I think uh, we should also step back and see whether we have been too generous in terms of uh, giving incentives. Like for instance, just now I used the example of uh, zoning the whole historic core commercial, for instance. 
you know, at that point, it was an imp important kind of incentives. Uh, but going forward, you know, I think we want to see how to, how to create an environment or a, to conserve a house, for instance, in this case, how to conserve a house without it looking like a Frankenstein, right? And uh, so, so it all involves actually taking stock uh, and say that maybe we should, uh, if we are all wanting better quality uh, for the conservation of the building and for the environment, and then maybe we cannot incentivize totally. Yeah, I have my, um, we have heard in uh, some criticisms like, about our uh, outer area conservation area, allowing four or five stories building at the back and all that, you know. I mean, in the recent uh, panel expert that you convened, you know, the overseas panel obviously feels that um, that should not have been allowed, yeah. Um, but the reason for doing that is so that you do not deprive those owners of a total sort of loss of uh, development, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a balance that we have to strike, you know. But I would say that um, maybe on the part of the planner, you should be a bit more, um, maybe a bit less generous, I would say, in the name of uh, better quality. Okay, public-private partnership. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's not the PPP like the stadium, you know, <laughs> that the private sector come out with the money in total and the government, you know, deliver certain commitment. When we talk about public-private partnership, I mean, during my time, uh, um, we're talking about always coming up with a win-win approach. Okay? So, I give you some example. Um, since we, we talk about the experts say we did not do the right thing for those street blocks, such as Chuchet Gelang outside at the fringe of the city. Um, you do not know the inside story, okay? We thought that was a very creative approach and solution in order to save these secondary settlements. Had we die die say you have to keep the whole shop house, they will no longer be standing there anymore. I can assure you for sure. So we came forth with a creative solution, we thought. If you walk on the streets, you will still see the two to three storey conserve main building of the original shop house. The new building, four or five storey, only appear after the air well. And from even across the road, you can't see the four or five storey building totally. So we still manage to maintain the human scale of the street. So I think uh, we please take a walk there <laughs> to, <laughs> to witness for yourself. You see, we, we, I think we have, um, I would say we have more successes than failure. Um, other successes include bungalows. You have bungalows where the zoning of the land is for high rise, high density housing. It could be 2.8 prop ratio or three or more. But we managed to you know, conserve many of these bungalows by working with the developer and their architects to find a way to conserve, like Spring Grove is one example, the bungalow house is retained, but they can have a high-rise apartment behind. Now, of course, we encourage them to you know, um, put the, the, the conserved bungalow as a clubhouse use, but some of them, for cash flow economic reasons, may then subdivide the bungalow into two or three apartments. Um, so the success story is not so good, yeah? But at least we maintain we managed to conserve the house. The other house is if you go along Cane Hill Road, you see a bungalow perch on the hilltop. I think that is Tan Chin Tuan's house. Yeah. We also managed to convince the the owner to conserve the house and have a high rise building behind it. The butterfly house, I have to say, internally, UIA, we have many debates and struggles. Some of us agree, some of us disagree. However, if you look at it today, it still gives the Amber Road a piece of history. Although it may not be the best example, but there's a piece of history on the ground. I think when we talk about, I think I, I don't talk too much about social community or this. Uh, my focus will be more on how do we retain sense of history, sense of place? All of you, the young people, don't have to go to the 
library to see how the old historic district looks like. You can go to the historic districts and visit them today. Except they look new, la. they don't look dilapidated. <laughs> you know? And uh, you don't find clock makers anymore. Why? Any of you own a pair of clocks at home? None, right? So they can't survive. So, Johannes, I think... Uh, Yes, I think, I think if you ask a question, uh, example that, that works outside yeah. Singapore. So outside I will Singapore. try to give some examples. For example, like uh, in Kyoto, mm. inside Kyoto city, they have uh, 17 World Heritage Sites. And in 2007, the Kyoto uh, published uh, uh, cultural landscape guidelines, which combine the, the natural and cultural aspect for the to keep Kyoto as a Kyoto 100 years later. And in that uh, guidelines, actually is from the master plan level up to the details level, even to the preservation of the Machia houses, uh, even come up with the idea of the public-private uh, corporations like the incentive. Mm -hmm. So there's a funding, a fund that is uh, the money coming from the government and also from the private sectors and can be used to restore the Machia into the original conditions. So, and even the, the, there is a plan to cut the height of the buildings with uh, 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 cutting the views, for example, to the mountain. Mm. And there's an incentive if someone willing to cut the building, the apartment and so on. So this is one good example how to look into the, the, the that works, that can manage the city. And second is regarding the, your, your concern just now about the, the, the voices of the community that the community have a way to do something. You can visit Kawagoe city in Saitama. It's a small town, and then the local community, especially the youth, the, youth, the member of the Chamber of Commerce, set up a gathering every month and act like an informal uh, city hall. And they invite experts, uh, academics, and even the government officers to sit down in this gathering to decide on the, the, the proposals of one of those neighbors who want to open a shop or McDonald's or whatever, and they give them uh, a frank uh, uh, advice saying they want to preserve the Edo style streets. So they have uh, an aesthetic guidelines, but then they also open to new ideas, and then they give them a social sanctions. If you don't do this, then okay, we are your enemies now. <laughs> and then if they get this a blessing from this group, they can go to the government and get the formal approval. And the government will give approval because the member of the government, like you, for example, has become the member of this gathering. Mm. So we have an organization like Ecomos Singapore, we have the Komomo Singapore, or whatever. That could be a kind of a middle ground that public, private, corporate, whoever can sit together and discuss to have a conversations. And then we can come up with a, a certain um, ideas. Mm. I think, I think Singapore is a, a very fortunate location in a region with actually many other heritage cities and we have friends in the region who are willing to talk to us and to cross-share ideas. I think heritage is something that can bring people together and we definitely must learn from each other. Which is, um, just to share with you, some of you may not be aware that we have piloted this little uh, consultative process in Kampong Glam, uh, which is an area that URA does place management. Um, which is about 10 years now, our, our effort. Um, you may see many murals in Kampong Glam in the past five, six years. They are very colourful, very Instagrammable, very tourist friendly. Um, I've got relatives from Hong Kong who come to Singapore and say, I don't want to eat chicken rice, I want to see the murals in Kampong Glam. I've got three hours, where do I go, right? Um, but it's not so rosy uh, all the way. We actually had some resistance from the older members or the former residents of Kampong Glam who said, Look, we love murals, but maybe we ex expect them to serve a different function. So as place managers, we actually brought the young artists from the Ariwa Art Centre, who are the ones behind the murals, the landlords who actually commissioned the murals, and a community panel who said, OK, let's talk about murals. The young people were very excited. Wow, we do murals. And then the, the older folks um, then said, you know, um, we love murals too. We really like them. But why are your murals also angry? <laughs> so this actually caught 
this actually caught the young artists by surprise. I think it was something that as planners, we were aware of these tensions. But as you know, right, some things, if your mum tells you, you won't listen. It's when your girlfriend tells you, you will listen. Right? So it was important for the artists to hear this authentic voice from the residents who said, we love murals, but perhaps they need to have a certain function beyond aesthetics. But it is a new way of working. It takes a lot more time, including from the ground. Because if you don't step up the public conversation, then I think we won't have that better outcome. Um, time is almost running up. I will propose maybe two more questions. Keep it short, then we'll answer together. Perhaps uh, that young lady there and the young lady there. Please really keep it concise, and then I can get the pen to respond. Um, hi, uh, um, my name is Christina. Uh, Christina, I'm an architect. Yeah, I just wanted to um, maybe like um, I mean, I my opinion is that I think we have all reached a certain level of awareness that the conservation of heritage and historical buildings has been established uh, for many years. So I, I just wanted to bring the topic back to the subject of today, like what's next for conservation. So one of the speakers, uh, I think it was Dr. Bidodo or is it Mr. Mock, uh, mentioned that how um, time is always moving and um, how modern buildings in Singapore, especially in the CBD areas, are, in my opinion, now facing a potential and real crisis, especially for on block, um, for strata titled buildings. Um, I, I understand that the aesthetics is subjective, but uh, these buildings represent, I mean, in my opinion, it, it represents the aspirations, the boldness, the fighting spirit of um, the pioneering modernist architects of our time, of their time. And uh, I think it harnesses the intangible qualities which, um, you know, in the, in the event that they are demolished, it might leave this vacuum of architectural heritage um, uh, of Singapore. So um, my question to uh, any of the panelists is, um, what is your take on uh, our now, uh, mo the modernist architecture that has now turned um, older uh, in terms of okay. conservation? How about this building? Thank you. Now, the question from the other lady, and then we can ask the panel to respond. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joanne. I'm a student from NUS. So, um, actually, my question is quite uh, similar to what the other lady mentioned. Um, in looking forward to what's next for conservation, other than shop houses, of course, um, there are also the modernist buildings and even postmodern buildings that we can consider for conservation. So, also similar, just wondering what's URA's take on this? And it, just one more question. Um, in particular, there are some migrant communities in these, uh, in these older buildings that are not so conventionally CMIO. So, for example, the Thai Enclave in Golden Mile, I'm just wondering in terms of preserving culture and heritage, although they are not part of the conventionally Singaporean uh, ethnicities, what can be done to preserve this kind of almost organic um, heritage that has sprung up in these buildings? Thank if you very much. we are talking about preservation. Yep. Thank you very much. Well, it would be great if each of you were to share your thoughts on this. Maybe Yuning can be the last one. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, it's a very short one. Everything changed, so it's inevitable. Uh, your generations, young generation, have no baggage, have no emotional links with the Chinese temples or Hindu temples or colonial buildings. So we should move forward, considering that the building built in the 60s, 70s, 80s is part of our heritage. So the, the listing by the National Heritage Board, or PMBF, have to move also into this uh, new territory of the buildings. And talking about the ethnicity, it's not static. Of course, maybe it's a, it's a time now to remove all these boxes and let the cosmopolitan Singapore become real cosmopolitan. The Indian is not just speaking Tamil, it's also we have a lot of Hindis, a lot of Malayalam, a lot of uh, Bangla, uh, Bengalis, and Nepalese. Even the Peng Nepalese has been with us for long uh, in, in the Kurga army and so on. Even the Malay is not just Malay from Malaysia, but also Indonesian Malay, also from Java, from everywhere. So maybe it's a, for the future, it's a, we are quite mature actually to handle diversity. So it's not a threat anymore, but it's become a strength. Because we are diverse, so we are become mongrels, and this mongrel is more resilient. Hmm. 
it's not easy to get sick. We have a lot of connections. You can eat anything. <laughs> so I think there is the good things about cosmopolitanism and hybridity. And even the, 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 the buildings like Golden Miles, like People's Park Complex, uh, like for example, like Golden Miles with the Thai community, well, it's a natural thing, right? Like Peninsula Plaza with the Myanmar community, City Plaza with Indonesians. They give colors. And modern, the beauty of modern architecture, because modern architecture is very functional, it provides frame, neutral frames of whatever colors they can grow into the future use of the buildings. So keeping golden miles, keeping people's park complex doesn't mean you have to stick into the old functions, but it gives an opportunity to return the building into the brute concrete, like gray, not colorful like orange and green. <laughs> and let the peoples become the colors. And the colors can be anything. I think that is my take for the future. Thank you. I guess to answer very quickly, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Singapore Heritage Society's position paper on regenerating modern icons. It's called Too Young to Die. You can download a copy from our website. Um, and then it, we've, we've given many recommendations for how we think uh, these modernist icons could be uh, given a new lease of life and the kind of policy recommendations we have, perhaps in, in terms of incentives that could be offered to owners and developers for, 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 for keeping these buildings. The challenge to these new policy recommendations, and I, I think Yuning might have some uh, opinions to share on that, uh, because they are new, they haven't been used in Singapore before, and that requires a bit of work. Um, the other question about the, these migrant communities that we see clustering around a lot of these buildings, I think it's because, it's because the, 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 the rent there is low, they're affordable. And that's a challenge, I think, in, throughout our conversation today. One thing that's been on the back of my mind is where are the spaces for Singaporeans and, and, and real communities from the ground, not, not talking about business communities with, with uh, plenty of financial resources, but really the kind of people you saw in my slides, where's the room for them to find a space to do the things that are important to them? Or even for groups like Singapore Heritage Society, now if we're trying to look for, we don't have an office, we don't have a space by the way, we are completely itinerant. Um, we're trying to look for a space, it's so hard to find somewhere that that we can afford. We, we're completely volunteer run, we have no resources. So that kind of thing I think is a challenge in our city. Um, and I, um, yeah, that's just a bigger question, so. So I think, um, yes, I agree that it's time to move on and look at uh, from each era, what are the excellent examples that we should retain as part of our social memories, as part of the milestones for our architectural history. And therefore, these uh, modern buildings, definitely they are the next sort of uh, milestone. Yeah? And if you look at the number of uh, these early modern buildings that have been gazetted, uh, many of them now are coming from the government public building stock. So in that sense, there is uh, already making some uh, effort into keeping some of these uh, example, Queenstown Library, right, and many others. Yeah, um, the the ones which are grabbing a lot of headlines are the privately owned multi uh, ownership type of uh, big big building, strata type building, and of course, I think these are especially the the so-called big tree, you know, are very important buildings and we should make an effort to um, save them. Um, judging from last year's um, reaction uh, in the press and from the ground, I think there has been enough, not say enough, it's never enough, okay? There, there's been quite a lot of, of, of reaction and all that coming from the ground. And I really hope this will carry on because those voices are very important to sway the political decision. I think Mrs. Cole can tell you a history of how the shop houses battle was fought, <laughs> right? And uh, you just have to make sure the people making the policy right on top um, take that leadership position and are prepared to take a position so I think we need that at this, at this point in time. And I think the ground's effort uh, do 
try to write more letters and organize more seminars and all that. I would encourage you to do that. I would, uh, in fact, um, based on this, um, I know from re interacting with some of the heritage uh, circle huh, um, that the desire to keep some of this modernist building goes beyond just iconic. You know, I mean, as lots of discussion today is about community memories and this and that, you know. So, whether it's a Thai community living there, you want to keep the place as well as keep the Thai community. I mean, these are issues which um, we, we have to actually have prioritized them. To me, the, the modern buildings, um, they are outstanding examples which the academic, the expert, they can use rational explanation to tell you why some of these are outstanding examples that have to be kept. But there are many others who are lesser examples. In my opinion, they are not so important to be kept. But I think we have come to also a point where we talk about sustainability, you know. And our culture of demolishing buildings when they are still very young is not sustainable. So I would argue for some of these lesser buildings to be kept for as long as they can using the angle of sustainability and not using the angle of their architectural merit and their social political significance. Don't use that, that kind of angle to argue for some of the lesser buildings to be kept. But as far as some of the most important ones which are still not safe, I would say yes, time is very urgent and we have to do our best to, we have to put in our little bit of effort, you know, to try to save them. You know, the subject of conserving modern post-independent building is not new. Um, and it's not new to URA either. More than 10 years ago, at URA, we already done the homework. I say that because I did the homework before I retire. <laughs> 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 it, but it was not timely then. In 2005, in fact, we got Dr. Wong Yong Chi to do a two publication um, titled Singapore One to One City and the other volume Singapore One to One Island. In these two volumes of publication, we already documented all the significant buildings, post modern and post-independent buildings that we think are architecturally, socially, historically important in these two publications. So the, the archival search and documentation is done. But 10, more than 10 years ago, it was not timely for us to embark on a conservation journey to conserve these buildings then. But I do feel that it is now timely for my younger colleagues at URA to embark this journey in a big comprehensive way. We probably have to learn from our past 30 years, how did we go about to get things done? Of course, it's uh, more difficult, I would say, than before. Um, there are many challenges, many considerations, many um, factors that you need to take into consideration. But one suggestion I have is perhaps URA do not hold so tightly to that plan. We need to come up with a conservation master plan that presents throughout the entire island which are the significant post-independent modern buildings that we think are important to keep them as landmarks because they are really landmarks for the entire island. Um, you, we have to work with the private sector collectively to think of um, what are feasible, practical incentives to make each and every building financially, economically viable for the um, multiple strata stakeholder or for a deep pocket developer who feels that it is affordable and feasible for him to buy off 
the entire block and block, but not to do en block redevelopment. I, I have great faith and hope. I, I think one of these buildings are being in discussion. It's a public-private partnership. It is in discussion as to how the um, government can give certain incentives so that the developer can buy en block and restore the building and put it to a new users. It could be the same use or it could be renovated. Um, large units could become smaller units or some residential could be converted to hotel or service apartments and so on and so forth. So I think it's timely to launch in a big way exhibitions, forums, seminars and so on to debate and discuss and maybe collectively we can come up with some suggestions of how to make each and every building um, feasible. They are difficult to do because they are not like um, shop houses, you know. You can have one formula fit all in terms of incentives. But these post-independent modern building, each and every building calls for a different set of incentives. Some, you could give them additional GFA, they add another tower. I think per bank, the 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 stake strata stakeholder has asked for that and i believe uia has granted them additional gfa but then on the basis that they get 100 percent consensus of all the strata owners and that did not work out because the m block only requires 80 percent consensus so therefore it will be down soon because the 80 percent won the won the battle they, will not manage, they did not manage to get 100% consensus to conserve. But perhaps we should um, change the conservation to 80% consensus as well, so that it's fair and equitable to end block redevelopment. Another... Well, Mrs. Cole, another, I'd like to clarify your another, understanding about another the Another suggestion I have is um, maybe we need not do conservation as per se. We can defer... Demo demolition, we can retain them as long as we can because these buildings are still structurally sound and habitable. For example, I read in the newspaper, Bayshore is also talking about M Block. I mean, it's, to me, it's crazy, you know. The, the whole condo is still looking very good and very livable. So I think some numbers is um, getting wrong. Mrs. Ko, I just want to clarify uh, the 80% and 100%. You don't need 100% for the conservation. The 100% is really because they need to change their share values in order to capitalize on the additional GFA provided to them. So for the structure owners to agree to proceed with conservation, they don't need the 100% consent. I think that's uh, somehow, there's some misunderstanding about this part. Um, but I think certainly the recent modern buildings are an important part of our history, both architecturally and socially. And as Wei Wei mentioned, I think from the state's perspective, we have been trying to conserve quite a number of what we think are critical buildings, whether it's your Zhuang Town Hall, uh, the Science Tower at Bukit Timah and US campus, and I think uh, subcourts also have been conserved. And beyond that, some of the developers that are more uh, prepared to work with us very closely, like Change Alley, Aerial Tower, I think Aerial Plaza, that's been conserved. And of course, earlier on would be things like AIA Tower. So we are very keen to partner developers who are willing to do it. And uh, I think as Mrs. Cole mentioned, we have tried to put incentives on the table to make it a workable formula. We appreciate partners like uh, Heritage Society for coming forth with uh, not just the lobbying to keep it, but also some practical su suggestions on how the, the way forward could be done. I think in our position paper, there are a lot of good ideas in there that we are trying to explore and study. But some of these would need legislative changes to make it uh, you know, easier to proceed on some of these ideas. Uh. So certainly, we are very keen to conserve the critical buildings and we are finding the way forward. And like Mrs. Cole say, it cannot be a standard formula. It needs to be customized to each of the site, whether there's space to put any additional 
uh, floor area, whether there's potential for change of use to make it a more um, viable project. But many of these modern buildings also have a lot of maintenance issues. Uh, although they are of modern past, some of them are 40 to 50 years old, quite run down by now. And they're huge buildings, they are very large buildings, and a lot of owners within them are in a way suffering from the poor maintenance situation. So uh, I think it's really a balance about the different needs and finding the way forward. Um, sorry, I, I still have something to say and in response to Yu Ning's um, comment. I, I've been out of the system, so I do not know whether it is a very fearful thing to do. To me, we have been approaching this um, conservation of significant building, building by building as and when. So I thought instead of approaching it that way, would it be considerable, cons conceivable that URA have a major exhibition that exhibits all these 40, 50, or you know, whatever numbers of buildings that we feel that has merit for retention, for conservation. Then we can follow up with many rounds of forum, seminar, debates, so that it is all open and transparent, and everybody can do their homework and do their simulation to say, okay, maybe this building, I can do this and that, and maybe it can be feasible financially, economically viable to conserve. So everybody is involved in doing all these sums, whether be it the sitting owner or the sitting multiple owners, or it could be potential developer, and so on and so forth. Then I think we can begin the journey. Begin the journey. It will probably take 30 years, but at least we start the journey, you know, to make it open and transparent. But <clears throat> I think I, I have my misgiving about the reason for Pearl Bank to be demolished because 40 years is run down and so on and so forth. But each and every strata owner is supposed to come out with um, every month X amount of sinking fund. And the sinking fund is to be built up to replace and repair as we move along. So if they have not done that, and I'm surprised, I think they are not um, rent control buildings that the owners can't increase their rental and therefore they can't you know, keep their building in good state like the shop houses. But these modern buildings, is not under any control. So they should be able to you know, contribute to a sinking fund to make sure that the building is in, in a good state of repair all the time. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Promise, 30 seconds. Yes, Chi <laughs> Tiong. I think today, very importantly, is our culture of sustainability as mentioned by Wing Wing. And also our on block has gone far, far beyond what they should be doing. We should accept all our concrete building of a minimum life of 80 to 100 years. Cannot be subjected to end block. But we can deal with other aspects of the structural problem that can be demolished. Otherwise, it cannot be letting the commercial, uh, this engine, you know, on block be so strong and push through all our conservation efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Xi Tiong. I, I think, uh, I think Xi Tiong having the last word also reminds me of um, his role in our conservation journey to today. Because years and years ago, he wrote a very nice piece about how he wanted his home in Jalan Besar to be around for his children to see. And that was about 30 years ago. And it's been conserved, all of it, today. So I think... Yes? Okay. I wrote an article to the SIP Journal. Then the Straits Times journalist Gretchen, today is Mrs. Liu Taiker. She was a Straits Times reporter 
she found this article and insisted to visit my dilapidated houses. I was so ashamed to let her into my Jalan Besar number 49A at the corner of Dixon Road. She insisted to visit and she was so impressed that the link between me and my father and my son had been rooted in that rent control houses for 50 years and how we actually grew up from there. So she asked me to write a book on shop houses in Singapore. I was practicing and I said I had no time. In the end, she wrote the book and she published my article in the Straits Times. And she married Liu Tai Ke. And therefore, <laughs> and therefore, Liu Tai Ke has the idea of conservation. Oh. <laughs> you say that's why Mr. Liu got the idea of conservation. Okay, okay, I, I, I think that part, last part, we have to go and talk about it. But, um, but I think the, the, we are so lucky to be here today with everybody because we have benefited from a very long-term view and also a very broad view of how we've come to be where we are today. I think conservation was gazetted 30 years ago, but the journey to get to that point started way before that. And the journey ahead is an even longer one because conservation is about sustainability, which is a sunrise industry for all of you, right? So I think we've heard the views that changing times needs changing approaches. And for changing approaches, we have to explore many different ideas collectively and to find then what works for the situation. So I think that's why it's so interesting, it's so tough, and that's why we need everyone to be part of the conversation. So thank you again so much to be being with us here today for the launch. And let's give a round of applause to our expert panelists here. And thank you to CLC and to Katiana really again for bringing this book to, to fruition today. And I think we wish you all the best for your own delivery. <laughs> and may I now invite all of us next door for a little reception and for more conversations. Thank you very much again and have a good weekend ahead.